Lesson 4 Fear God and give glory to Him Sabbath Afternoon April 15 As God made known His will to the Hebrew captives, to those who were most separate from the customs and practices of a world lying in wickedness, so will the Lord communicate light from heaven to all who will appreciate of thus saith the Lord. To them he will express his mind. Those who are least bound up with worldly ideas are the most separate from display and vanity and pride and love of promotion, who stand forth as his peculiar people, zealous of good works. To these he will reveal the meaning of his word. The very first exhibition of God's power to the Hebrew captives was in showing the defective wisdom of the great ones of the earth. The wisdom of men is foolishness with God. Our work now is to enlighten the world in the place of bearing a peace and safety message. A banner has been placed in our hands, upon which is inscribed, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is a distinct, separating message, a message that is to give no uncertain sound. It is to lead the people away from the broken cisterns that contain no water to the fountain of living waters. Letter 60, 1898 Is there not enough taking place about us to show us the dangers that beset our path? Everywhere are seen wrecks of humanity, neglected family altars, broken up families. There is a strange abandonment of principle, a lowering of the standard of morality. The sins are fast increasing, which caused the judgments of God to be poured upon the earth in the flood and in the destruction of Sodom by fire. We are nearing the end. God has borne long with the perversity of mankind, but their punishment is no less certain. Let those who profess to be the light of the world depart from all iniquity. We see the very same spirit manifested against the truth that was seen in Christ's day. For want of Bible arguments, those who are making void the law of God will manufacture falsehoods to stain and blacken the workers. They did this to the world's Redeemer. They will do it to his followers. Reports that have not the least foundation will be asserted as truth. God has blessed his commandment-keeping people, and all the opposition and falsehoods that may be brought against them will only strengthen those who stand firm in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints. But if those who profess to be the depositaries of God's law become transgressors of that law, his protecting care will be withdrawn, and many will fall through perverseness and licentiousness. Then we shall indeed be unable to stand before our enemies. But if his people remain separate and distinct from the world as a nation that do righteousness, God will be their defense, and no weapons formed against them shall prosper. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 601. Sunday, April 16. Fear God. The third angel is flying in the midst of heaven, heralding the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This represents the work which is to be done in these last days. The message loses none of its power in its onward flight. John sees the work increasing in power till the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. The message Fear God and keep His commandments for the hour of His judgment is come, is to go with a loud voice. With intensified zeal and energy, human beings are to carry forward the work of the Lord. In the home, in the school, and in the church, men, women, and youth are to be prepared to give the message to the world. We need strong, devoted, self-sacrificing young men and young women who will press to the front. Sons and Daughters of God, page 207. Christ's followers today should guard against the tendency to lose the spirit of reverence and godly fear. The scriptures teach men how they should approach their Maker, with humility and awe, through faith in a divine mediator. The psalmist has declared, The Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. 
O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Psalm 95, verses 3 to 6. True reverence for God is inspired by a sense of His infinite greatness and a realization of His presence. With this sense of the unseen, every heart should be deeply impressed. The hour and place of prayer are sacred because God is there. And as reverence is manifested in attitude and demeanor, the feeling that inspires it will be deepened. Holy and reverend is his name, the psalmist declares. Psalm 111, verse 9. Angels, when they speak that name, veil their faces. With what reverence then should we, who are fallen and sinful, take it upon our lips? Prophets and Kings, pages 47 and 48. Humility and reverence should characterize the deportment of all who come into the presence of God. In the name of Jesus, we may come before him with confidence, but we must not approach him with the boldness of presumption as though he were on a level with ourselves. There are those who address the great and all-powerful and holy God who dwelleth in light unapproachable as they would address an equal or even an inferior. There are those who conduct themselves in his house as they would not presume to do in the audience chamber of an earthly ruler. These should remember that they are in his sight whom seraphim adore, before whom angels veil their faces. God is greatly to be reverenced. All who truly realize his presence will bow in humility before him, and, like Jacob, beholding the vision of God, they will cry out, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 252 Monday April 17. Fearing and Obeying God We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In His divine arrangement, through His unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit alone, and the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity, which we perform, are the fruits of faith, and they become a blessing to us, for men are to be rewarded according to their works. It is the fragrance of the merit of Christ that makes our good works acceptable to God, and it is grace that enables us to do the works for which He rewards us. Our works in and of themselves have no merit and our works could not have been performed in the strength of our own sinful natures. The Lord has bidden us to draw nigh to Him, and He will draw nigh to us, and drawing nigh to Him, we receive the grace by which to do those works which will be rewarded at His hands. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1122. A legal religion can never lead souls to Christ for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by a self-justifying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. The solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposing sacrifice, proclaim that the doer of these things regards himself as righteous and as entitled to heaven. But it is all a deception. Our own works can never purchase salvation. As it was in the days of Christ, so it is now. The Pharisees do not know their spiritual destitution. The righteousness of Christ is to them as a robe unworn, a fountain untouched. Man must be emptied of self before he can be, in the fullest sense, a believer in Jesus. When self is renounced, then the Lord can make man a new creature. New bottles can contain the new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life. In him who looks unto the author and finisher of our faith, the character of Christ will be manifest. The Desire of Ages, page 280. 
the strength given to Christ in the hour of bodily suffering and mental anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane has been and will be given to those who suffer for his dear name's sake. The same grace given to Jesus, the same comfort, the more than mortal steadfastness, will be given to every believing child of God who is brought into perplexity and suffering and threatened with imprisonment and death by Satan's agents. Never has a soul that trusts in Christ been left to perish. The rack, the stake, the many inventions of cruelty may kill the body, but they cannot touch the life that is hid with Christ in God. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1123. Tuesday, April 18. Living a God-Centered Life I am instructed that every believer must watch unto prayer lest he fail in the Christian life battle. Every soul must daily seek the Lord with full purpose of heart, morning, noon, and night, and let the mind dwell upon the Word of God to understand His requirements. The one all-important matter is to serve the Lord with full purpose of heart and seek to become the Lord's heart and mind. All who come to the Savior for counsel will receive the very help they need if they will come in humility and with assurance cling to that promise, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Lift up the standard, beginning with full surrender and continuing in the simplicity of obedience to all the Lord's commandments according to His special directions. None of the important things specified in His Word are to be neglected. This Day with God, page 128 You should control your thoughts. This will not be an easy task. You cannot accomplish it without close and even severe effort. Yet God requires this of you. It is a duty resting upon every accountable being. You are responsible to God for your thoughts. If you indulge in vain imaginations, permitting your mind to dwell upon impure subjects, you are, in a degree, as guilty before God as if your thoughts were carried into action. All that prevents the action is the lack of opportunity. Day and night, dreaming and castle building are bad and exceedingly dangerous habits. When once established, it is next to impossible to break up such habits and direct the thoughts to pure, holy, elevated themes. You will have to become a faithful sentinel over your eyes, ears, and all your senses if you would control your mind and prevent vain and corrupt thoughts from staining your soul. The power of grace alone can accomplish this most desirable work. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 561. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, verse 10. Christians should cultivate a love for meditation and cherish a spirit of devotion. Many seem to begrudge moments spent in meditation and the searching of the scriptures and prayer as though the time thus occupied was lost. I wish you could all view these things in the light God would have you for you would then make the kingdom of heaven of the first importance. To keep your heart in heaven will give vigor to all your graces and put life into all your duties. To discipline the mind to dwell upon heavenly things will put life and earnestness into all our endeavors. When the mind is thus filled, the believer in Christ will be able to bring forth good things from the treasure of the heart. Sons and Daughters of God, page 109. Wednesday, April 19, Giving Glory to God To give glory to God is to reveal His character in our own and thus make Him known, and in whatever way we make known the Father or the Son, we glorify God. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 979. 
Providence has been leading the people of God out from the extravagant habits of the world, away from the indulgence of appetite and passion, to take their stand upon the platform of self-denial and temperance in all things. The people whom God is leading will be peculiar. They will not be like the world. If they follow the leadings of God, they will accomplish His purposes and will yield their will to His will. Christ will dwell in the heart. The temple of God will be holy. Your body, says the apostle, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God does not require His children to deny themselves to the injury of physical strength. He requires them to obey natural law in order to preserve physical health. Nature's path is the road he marks out, and it is broad enough for any Christian. With a lavish hand, God has provided us with rich and varied bounties for our sustenance and enjoyment. But in order for us to enjoy the natural appetite, which will preserve health and prolong life, he restricts the appetite. He says, beware, restrain, deny unnatural appetite. If we create a perverted appetite, we violate the laws of our being and assume the responsibility of abusing our bodies and of bringing disease upon ourselves. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 160. Man is God's workmanship, his masterpiece, created for a high and holy purpose, and on every part of the human tabernacle, God desires to write his law. Every nerve and muscle, every mental and physical endowment is to be kept pure. God designs that the body shall be a temple for his spirit. How solemn, then, is the responsibility resting on every soul. If we defile our bodies, we are doing harm not only to ourselves, but to many others. Be brave and overcome every practice which mars the soul temple. We are wholly dependent on God, and our faith is strengthened by believing, though we cannot see God's purpose in His dealing with us, or the consequence of this dealing. Faith points forward and upward to things to come, laying hold of the only power that can make us complete in Him. Reflecting Christ, page 165. God calls for a living sacrifice. The body, he tells us, is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the habitation of his spirit, and he requires all who bear his image to take care of their bodies for the purpose of his service and his glory. Ye are not your own, says the inspired apostle, ye are bought with a price, wherefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In order to do this, add to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. It is a duty to know how to preserve the body in the very best condition of health, and it is a sacred duty to live up to the light which God has graciously given. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 70. Thursday, April 20. Revelations Overcomers The sinner's only hope is to rely wholly upon Jesus Christ. Our acceptance with God is sure only through His beloved Son, and good works are but the result of the working of His sin-pardoning love. They are no credit to us, and we have nothing accorded to us for our good works by which we may claim a part in the salvation of our souls. Salvation is God's free gift to the believer, given to him for Christ's sake alone. The troubled soul may find peace through faith in Christ. He cannot present his good works as a plea for the salvation of his soul. Our High Calling, page 118. There are thousands today who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to commend them to His favor. When they are bidden to look to Jesus and believe that He saves them solely through His grace, they exclaim, How can these things be? Like Nicodemus, we must be willing to enter into life in the same way as the chief of sinners. Through Christ, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Through faith, we receive the grace of God, but faith is not our Savior. It earns nothing. It is the hand by which we lay hold upon Christ and appropriate His merits, the remedy for sin. And we cannot even repent without the aid of the Spirit of God. The Scripture says of Christ, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Repentance comes from Christ as truly as does pardon. The Desire of Ages, page 175. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Upon him who looks to Jesus as the author and finisher of his faith, Satan's temptations have no power. He cannot cause to sin the one who will accept by faith the virtues of him who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He who repents of his sin and accepts the gift of the life of the Son of God cannot be overcome. Laying hold by faith of the divine nature, he becomes a child of God. He prays. He believes. When tempted and tried, he claims the power that Christ died to give and overcomes through his grace. This every sinner needs to understand. He must repent of his sins. He must believe in the power of Christ and accept that power to save and to keep him from sin. The truth must be admitted into the soul, and it will work the sanctification of the character. It will refine and elevate the life and fit you for an entrance into the mansions which Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love him. Sons and Daughters of God, page 349. For further reading, lift him up. Results of Obedience to Physical Laws, page 160. And, Selected Messages, Christ Stands by the Side of Persecuted Saints, book 3, page 420.